عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونسلم على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. أهدنا الصراط المستقيم. صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. آمين. قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آل وسحبه دائما أبدا Salatam wa salaman alayki ya Sayyidi, ya Rasulullah. Last week we kind of um, took a break from talking about Imam Hussain al-Islam in Karbala. Uh, it doesn't mean we're, it's over. As I said, you know, the atrocities against uh, the household of Rasulullah Sassam did not end in Karbala. You know, we started talking about uh, the Asra wa Miraj, you know, the night journey of Rasulullah. Uh, which took place, according to many scholars, on the 27th night of this month of Rajab. The background, you know, we started talking about the background, and that's important to understand. You know, this was after, you know, Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow. Because you have the passing of the two greatest supporters of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, his wife, Bibi Khadija, radiallahu anha, you know, and within days of each other, his uncle, Hazrat Abu Talib, radiallahu anha. You know, and if you look at the two, from within, you know, the greatest supporter is his wife. And on the outskirts, on outside, the one who defended him against Quraysh, you know, is his uncle, Hazrat Abu Talib. You, know, you have other companions, but none of them could defend him like he defended him. <coughs> Hazrat Abu Talib was also the leader of Banu Hashim. You know, and this is why Quraysh always came to him. Or the other leaders of Quraysh would come to him and you know, ask him, hand over your nephew. Do this, do this. You know, we want your nephew, have him stop. All of these requests came to Hazrat Abu Talib. And all of the requests were rejected by Hazrat Abu Talib. You know, and and this is also why they could not lay a hand on him. It's because of this uncle. So this background needs to be, you know, you have to understand that to understand what go, why the event takes place. You know, shortly after they passed, Rasulullah also goes to Taif. He goes and preaches in Taif, and we know what they did. You know, they unleashed the dogs and the, and the children and they stoned him to the extent that, you know, as he was leaving, his, you know, the blood dripping down congealed in his shoes and even the shoes were stuck to his feet. Uh, and this is also when, you know, he stopped in the garden and uh, the Christian from Nineveh becomes Muslim uh, after seeing Rasulullah and talking about Yunus alayhi salam. Uh, and this is also when, when on this journey back is when the jinn, who had been looking for him for a long time, you know, because he knew something had, had happened. Because if you remember at the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu the, the authority or the power that Allah Subhanahu had given the jinn to listen to the angels, as well as to sit inside of the idols and speak, Allah Subhanahu took that power away. So when this happens, they know something unusual has happened, so they start traveling the world looking for what's happened. And this is when those six jinn from Iraq came and met Rasulullah and they become, became Muslim and then they went and brought back others uh, who eventually met Rasulullah as well. There are people who say that, you know, this event took place, the night journey took place because the Rasulullah was saddened that the people weren't becoming Muslim. So to console him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him on this journey. You know, 
the issue with that becomes that, you know, if you're sad for one reason, then how do you, you know, and somebody wants to make you happy, they don't do something else to make you happy, they fulfill the reason that you're sad. You know, and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not hard to make everybody Muslim. So if that was the issue, then that's what he would have done. But the thing is, when you're sent to a far off land, you know, the old saying in English that home is where the heart is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ no, We have not sent you except as a mercy to all of alameen, all of the worlds. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ You know, in every salat we say, Alhamdulillah, رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord and cherisher and sustainer of all of the worlds. And so that Lord and cherisher and sustainer says about his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rahmatul lil alameen. So wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabb, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Rahmah. So wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cherisher and sustainer, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the mercy. But the interesting thing in that verse is that he says, we have not sent you. We sent you except as a mercy to all of creation. So if, you know, give you an example, we have this room. You know, if the chairs are in the room. If I pick up a chair and move it from one side of the room to the other side of the room, I can't say that, well, I sent the chair to the room. The chair was already in the room. If there, if there is a chair outside of the room, and I take that chair and bring it into the room, now I can set, say that that chair was sent to the room. But if it's already in the room, then you can't say that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, he has separated Rasulullah from all of the rest of creation, from all of the worlds. And he says that we do not send you, send you, except as a mercy to all of the worlds. And I'm not going to go over, you know, today, today and next week, we're not going to go over all of the details of, of the journey, because we don't have time. And what's more important than the details are the lessons. Even though many of the lessons are in the details. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we, did not send, we have not sent you except as a mercy to all of creation, to all of the worlds, He has separated Him from the rest of creation. Which means that if he was sent as a creation to all of the worlds, he was created before all the rest of creation. He was somewhere other than the rest of creation. And the only somewhere is the presence of his Lord. So when all of these things in the background are going on, you know, you go to a place and everybody rejects you. You, the people reject you. Those who support you have now passed on. Your greatest supporters have just passed. You feel homesick. You want to go back home. And so to console his beloved, Sallallahu from this feeling, which is why Allah Subhanahu wa calls him back home, is, you know, if you look at the journey, you know, he goes from, and of course, the emphatic verse, the explicit verse in the Quran talking about this journey, <coughs> the first verse of Surah Bani Israel. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi, laylam min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa al ladhi barakna hawlahu, lanurihu min ayatina, innahu huwa samium basir. 
the statement starts off emphatically. Subhan. Pure. Subhan al pure is the one. Pure is he. It doesn't tell us who the he is. It doesn't say Subhan Allah. You know, it says Subhan. Pure is the one. Subhan al is Pure is the one who, who did this action. But it doesn't mention who that one is. But everybody knows. Everyone who reads the verse automatically knows who this one is. It is the one. It is Allah. So, Subhan al Asra bi Abdihi. Asra is a night journey. It's a trip or a journey you take at the night, in the night. So pure is the one who took by night, on this night journey, Abdi, his slave. The other interesting now, the interesting point is, he doesn't mention which slave. You know, if you read the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about other messengers as Abd, he specifies which one. Abduhu Zakaria. But here he doesn't specify. And yet everybody knows which Abd. You know, if you look at categories or, or stations of people, the beginning is Abd. Every one of us is Abd. All of creation is Abd. All of creation is a slave of Allah. And yet when he mentions his beloved وسلم, as Abd, he doesn't need to specify which Abd. Everybody knows. So if you look at levels or status of people, you know, you have Abd, the beginning. And then you have you know, various stations and among which are, you know, only Allah, Wali. And then, you know, among them other stations and then, you know, like if you look within regular people, you know, Tabi'i, Sahaba, Kram, Ahl al-Bayt, all of these stations. And then you get to Nabi. And you have Rasul and, and and, you know, within the Nabi, you have Rasul. And yet, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentions his beloved as Abd, he doesn't need to specify. Even in the Quran, when you read the Quran, when he mentions his Nabi, when he mentions his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Al-Nabi, again, he doesn't need to specify. Or Al-Rasul, he doesn't need to specify. It's automatically understood which Rasul. And what this, you know, in order to understand this concept here, you know, it's like if I go someplace and there's only one doctor in the whole place and somebody says, oh, the doctor came or the doctor went. I don't need to ask which doctor because that's the only doctor. But now if there are a lot of doctors, Then you have to say, oh, this doctor came, doctor so-and-so came, or doctor so-and-so left. Or doctor so-and-so did this. But if you have one doctor who stands out among all of them, as, oh, he's the doctor, then when you mention that doctor, you don't need to specify again. Because if I say, oh, the doctor came, then people understand, okay, this is that doctor, this is the one that stands out above all the rest of them. And so when I look at, you know, because the, you know, as we mentioned last week, the whole purpose of us knowing about this journey is that we at least have some glimpse or, or, a, or a, some understanding of the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That his position, his status among creation. So even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Rasulullah as Abd, which is the most basic level, he doesn't need to specify. 
Because even the beginning of Rasulullah is way beyond the ending of anyone else. The beginnings of the, the status of Rasulullah is far beyond and way out of the reach of the end position of any of the rest of creation. And so here again, he doesn't need to specify which abd. He says, Subhanallah the asrabi abd, abdihi, you know, who took his slave. Laylam min al masjid al haram. And again, he mentions layl. Layl is night. But when he, when he said asra, that's understood that it's night, because asra is the journey you take at night. So why mention night again? Because the emphasis here is that it's not. You know, it's not the whole night. It's a portion of the night. And if you actually look at the journey, it's such a small portion of the night that from a time perspective, it seems insignificant. Yet all of this happens within that time frame. To the extent that when he returns from the journey, his bed is still warm. And the chain on the door is still hanging. I mean, still swinging. Min yeah. al-Masjid al-Haram. That he took him from Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa to Masjid al-Aqsa. So he took him from Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions Masjid al-Aqsa, he doesn't emphasize the Masjid. He says, Masjid al-Aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu. The Masjid whose precincts are blessed. I mean, you know, you think about this. You know, if I talk about any Masjid, and I talk about the precincts of the Masjid, the blessed area is the Masjid. You know, if you, you know, even when we talk about, you know, Mecca, I mean, the whole city is, is blessed. But if you really talk about the real blessings, it's the Kaaba, it's the Hatim, and, and all of this area. That's right there. Yet, for Masjid al-Aqsa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Barakna hawlahu, the blessings whose precincts are blessed. So what are in the precincts of Masjid al-Aqsa? Who are there? The graves of all of these great prophets. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't emphasize the blessings of the Masjid, He emphasizes the blessings of the precincts of the Masjid. And then he says, إِنَّهُ وَالسَّمِيُمْ Basir," And he is seeing and hearing. Or hearing and seeing. So this is the verse that tells us about the going. If we look at the return, you know, as I mentioned last week, one verse mentions the journey explicitly. The other verses in Surah Najm refer to the journey implicitly. They refer to it, but not directly. So if we start off with Surah Najm, the first verse in Surah Najm, one Najmi Ida Hawa. Allah Spanta swears. By what? By the star. What is the star doing? As it returns or as it descends. He doesn't say Najum. It's not plural, the stars. So he's talking about, you know, An Najum, the star. You know, just like when he swears, Wad Duha. You know, if you look at the swearing of Allah, you swear by something that you love. And you see, 
you know, people they say, you know, they'll swear by their mother or swear by, you know, something. Of course, these days, you know, money is the most precious thing to everybody. So, you know, that's why on the dollar they say, we, in God we trust, because that's their God. But you see, you go someplace and say, Wallahi, Wallahi. You know, which is also one of the signs of the hour. Rasulullah said that people will swear by Allah in abundance. You know, useless. Everything becomes a swearing. It doesn't mean anything. You know, they take the name of Allah in vain, you know, in vain like a game. But when you swear, you swear by something that you, if, if you're truly swearing by something, you swear by something that's dear and near to you. If you look at where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears in the Quran, there's always some reference to Rasulullah. La Amruka. It says, I swear by your life. Even when he swears by himself, many places in the Quran, it's a reference to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But no, Allah swear, he says, by your Lord, oh my beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even he's swearing by himself, but he says, by your Lord. So when you look at this one najm, as the star descends, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is swearing by it. You swear, or rather you should swear, when something is a big deal. You make an emphatic statement because it's something that may be a little hard to believe. You swear by something that somebody, you know, that they won't believe normally. Something that technically would be impossible. So he says, one najmi idha hawa. Allah swears by the star, the star, as it returns or as it descends. Imam Jafar Sadiq, you know, to understand the weight of what somebody says, you have to understand their position. You know, just like the Quran, this significant why? Because it's the word of Allah. The hadith are significant why? Because these are the words and the actions of. Rasulullah. So in order to understand or, or understand the weight of Imam Jafar Sadiq's statement, we have to know who Imam Jafar Sadiq is. Imam Jafar Sadiq is the son of Imam Muhammad Baqir, who is the son of Imam Zain al Abidin, who is the son of Imam Hussein al Islam, who of course is the grandson of Rasulullah and the leader of the youth of Jannah. If I look at his father, Muhammad Baqir, Baqir means to open or unlock. And so he's known as Muhammad Baqir because he unlocked the mysteries of the Quran and the Sunnah. Imam Jafar Sadiq, you know, and actually there's a hadith in, in Say Muslim which talks about the meeting of, of Jabir ibn Abdullah with Imam Muhammad Baqir where Rasulullah had told Jabir that you will meet him and when you meet him you give him my salam and, and Jabir when he heard Imam Muhammad Baqir walking towards him he had lost his physical sight Jabir had lost his physical sight and he is giving this dars in, in the masjid of Rasulullah this lecture and he hears the foot, these footsteps coming, and he says to the people, he says, these are the footsteps of Rasulullah. <laughs> and then when he comes and he sits, he asks him, who are you? What's your name? He says, Muhammad. He says, Muhammad who? He says, Muhammad bin Ali. So now he knows for sure. He knew before, but now everybody else also knows. And again, this is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. So he, he brings him close to him, and he, and he smells him. He says, I smell the fragrance of Rasulullah so so coming from you. So his son is Imam Jafar Sadiq. Imam Jafar Sadiq is also amongst the teachers of Imam Malik, as well as the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa. 
and the level of and as far as teaching Imam Abu Hanifa Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq was, was poisoned martyred through poison year 148 Hijri Imam Abu Hanifa was martyred 150 Hijri Imam Abu Hanifa spent two years with him between 146 and 148 and Imam Abu Hanifa says so this is the end of his life he says that if I had not had those two those two years then I would not have understood anything So Imam Jafar Sadiq says that this verse, one najmi idha hawa, is referring to Rasulullah. The najm is Rasulullah so some, as he descend, as he returned from the night journey, as he descend, as he returned from the miraj. When Rasulullah so some, returns from this journey. And he comes out of his house. And actually, it was the house of his cousin. Um, uh, which was the sister of Ali. Ummi Hani. Ummi Hani. Yeah, Ummi Hani. Radhi Allah. So he, he spent the night there with his uncle, Ima, uh, Hamza. Radhi Allah. So when he comes out of the house, the first person he meets is Abu Jahl. greatest enemy and he tells him about the journey but he only tells him about the journey from Mecca to from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa he doesn't tell him about the rest of the journey he doesn't tell him about the journey home you know where he goes to all the levels of the heavens and uh, Jannah and sees hell and, and paradise and beyond Sidrat al-Muntaha and again, you can't even say to La Maqam because La Maqam, no place. I mean, how do you go to or from no place? You know, these are things that our mind can't comprehend. You know, so he only tells Abu Jahl about this portion of the journey. Because if you can't, if you can't comprehend this portion, then how can he comprehend anything else? So when he tells him that last night, you know, I went and I was to Aqsa and I led all of the prayers of the prophets because when he arrives in Aqsa, all of these prophets come and they make two rakat salat behind him. And then I, I came back all in one night. So Abu Jahl, he says, you know, Abu Jahl is by himself. He says, oh, you know, he says, um, if I bring some other people, will you tell them the same thing? He says, yes. He says, wait here. So he runs. He grabs his other, you know, yeah, the other chieftains of Quraysh, you know, the other uh, villains or the other partners in crime. And they all come. He says, tell them the same thing you told me. So Rasulullah he tells them the same thing he told Abu Jahl before. You know, again, talks about the journey. So now, this is when Abu Jahl, he says, ah, this is how I will create a issue between him and his friend Abu Bakr. Because the other thing that happened at this point was when this journey took place and Rasulullah Sussam came back and told the people, there were people among Quraysh who shortly before this had accepted Islam who now rejected it. Because they could not comprehend it. You know, if I look at this from a worldly standpoint, this was the worst time to be telling them about this journey. But my mind has no meaning. I have no value. So you had people that were leaving Islam. So Abu, ja Abu Jahl says, ah, I can go and create this issue now. So he goes to Abu Bakr. He says that if a man tells you, he makes it general. He says if somebody comes and tells you that he took that he in one night he left from Mecca and goes to Jerusalem and comes back all in one night, would you believe him? He said no. 
How can I believe him? No. So then he says, well, this is what your friend is saying. And so this is when Abu Bakr, then he says, well, if he's saying it, then it's true. Because, you know, in various narrations, in, one narr in some narrations, he, he says, because I see more miraculous things than even this from him every day. And in one narration, he even says that even if he said that he had gone through the heavens and back, I would believe him. Now, yet he hasn't heard it yet. And this is, of course, when he is given the title of Siddiq. Because he is testifying to the truthfulness of the one who is the most truthful. And this is also when... Ah. Well, time's up. Time's up. Uh, so inshallah we'll continue from here next week. And may Allah subhanahu wa help us understand. Uh, and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.